So, Russell, I, I would love, I know that, uh, I think most people know that you uh, recently became the president, the new president of the Ethics and Religious, Religious Liberty Commission, um, just because there are some, um, in fact, maybe more, uh, who are, would just kind of quietly under their breath say, what exactly is the Ethics of Religious and Liberty Commission, if I can even say it, say it yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and uh, the ERLC uh, from here henceforth. And what, why do we need one as Southern Baptists? Well, Southern Baptists have had a really spotty history when it comes to some horrific blind spots uh, that we have had. Uh, one of those being, of course, uh, one of the, the reasons why there even is a Southern Baptist Convention, which was over the question of human slavery. Uh, there were many uh, people who were preaching the Bible, they were preaching the gospel, and they were saying, we're not going to address slavery because that's a political issue, that's a social issue. All we're going to do is to stick to preaching the gospel. Of course, that has everything to do with the gospel, how it is that you treat people created in the image of God and act as though these are non-persons who can be owned by other persons. And then the same thing happened throughout the 20th century with Jim Crow. Uh, our commission, used to be called the Christian Life Commission, was established about 100 years ago to help churches to think through how do we apply the gospel to life, uh, to ethical, moral, social questions that face uh, people in congregations. And the commission has really had some really good aspects of its history and some really bad aspects of its history. When it comes to the, the racial question, uh, the commission was out ahead of time calling Southern Baptists to say, you all are hypocritical if you're taking your, your Lottie Moon money and evangelizing people in Africa when you won't receive African-American brothers and sisters in Christ right. into your churches. You're repudiating the gospel with that. And they were really, really good on applying the gospel to the racial issue long before when it was really courageous to do that. And then at a really dark period of time when it came to the issue of abortion, uh, my organization was associated with the Religious Coalition for Abortion Rights. Uh, was lobbying for legal abortion. Every, uh, every stage was really working within the SBC to pass a couple of resolutions in the 1970s that affirmed essentially the Roe versus Wade uh, position on abortion and saying this is a Catholic issue, uh, not a Protestant issue, not a Baptist issue, and really continued that uh, through the 1980s until the very end of the 1980s. So what, what we're commissioned to do is really to do two things. One of those things is to speak for Christians and churches in the public square, uh, in Washington, in state capitals, in the media, in the culture, and other places to help people to think through these are issues Christians are concerned about and specifically Baptist Christians are concerned about. And then secondly, and I think more, more importantly, that's important, but even more important than that, is to help equip churches to start thinking through here are issues you need to know about now. Uh, maybe issues that aren't even on the, on the plate and on the forefront of a congregation right now, but that will be uh, very soon. I mean, you start thinking through some of the things that we would have talked about if they had been raised a few years ago would seem ridiculous and, and science fiction. I mean, you're, you're talking about Internet pornography in 1990 uh, would, would have seemed really strange and distant uh, to most congregations, and yet as soon as this hit, it's here. Same thing with biomedical technologies and those sorts of things. So to equip churches to start thinking through those issues uh, ahead of time and to be ready to give an answer. So if I'm hearing you right, there's kind of three. You've got like a, it's sort of part, for lack of a better term, lobbyist group, part uh, uh, cultural profit that's able to speak into some conversations at levels that many of us will never be in, and then part advisor to the churches that's able to specialize. Is that, mm -hmm. is that a fair yeah, summation? To equip, to, yeah, to, to do advocacy. Uh, then to speak culturally, yes, and then to equip churches to start thinking through here, here are issues that we need to be thinking about, about world hunger, about pornography, about sex trafficking, about uh, infertility and how to ethically address that, all, that whole range of issues. Yeah. So uh, I, I know I've heard you speak with great respect for your predecessors mm -hmm. um, in this role, but um, where are we? I mean, what's been your biggest challenge this year as you've taken up the, the reins? Well, I think just in any transition, there's, there's going to be a lot, of, uh, a lot of things coming at you at one time. 
for me, I think the biggest, uh, the biggest transitional problem was that as soon as I took office, immediately everything hit. The Supreme Court handed down same-sex marriage decisions two weeks after I came into office. Uh, the HHS mandate came into effect. Uh, there was just kind of, there's been one thing after the other. So I just kind of am, am ready to say to the outside culture, hey, just let's take a week off for Christmas. <laughs> and, uh, Holidays, not Christmas. <laughs> that's right, yeah. Happy holidays, that's right. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the other guys, I mean, I mean Pastor Andy, what's your, uh, you know, as a, because uh, I know you took over First Baptist from Jerry Falwell, and so you didn't really have a lot of need for a guy to coach you on that. No, um, what, how would you, how do you see as a, a pastor of a, a local church, um, how do you see what they do as benefiting you, you and your members? Well, first of all, I'm just very grateful that Russell's there. I have a friendship with him, a respect for him, and I'm grateful for you, brother, being there. I thank God for you. Thank God that you're there. I'm looking forward to praying for you. And one of the aspects you talk about equipping churches, you really teach us how to speak about these things because you're a very careful thinker, and you're able to bridge that gap between biblical, um, timeless biblical principles and issues that are really new, as you said, and teaching us not just what they are, but how we as pastors can address them from the pulpit and how, you know, around the coffee uh, urn on, on Monday morning, we can be addressing some of these things. And, and we're going to have, have to be winsome, but, um, you know, uh, consistent biblically. And how to make the transition from these issues that really do not directly affect people's eternal states, but they're, they're related to transition to that which is most important, namely their own walk with Christ. And I think you're going to do a great job teaching us how to talk about those things. Danny, I, I, you know, you've not been around too long, but you've been around longer than I have, certainly. Um, as you see kind of the landscape of how Christians have engaged politically, um, I mean, I grew up in a church where it's not uncommon to get the voting guide, to get the Christian coalition approved things. I mean, it seemed like that line between prophecy conference and political position was not really a, um, a stark one. Um, how do you see things changing? And specifically, I know this is not a love Russ fest, but um, how do you see Russell being in the position he's in, signaling a new day? Like, what do we what do we anticipate a difference being going forward? And how you know, Southern Baptist churches, particularly, are known for their their stands on these things? Well, I think we have seen that that experiment was a failed experiment. Uh, I don't question at all the motivations of those people that got involved with what was known as the moral majority and that the fact that Southern Baptists in particular were more aligned with the Republican Party because we were pro-life, uh, we were pro-marriage. Uh, those two issues just stand out. Now, I wish we'd been more active when it came, uh, when it comes to issues like uh, poverty. Uh, I think we're, again, late to the game when it comes to issues like immigration reform, and I'm so thankful uh, that Russell's leading the charge there. I think, again, the uh, ERLC is ahead of the curve when it comes to Southern Baptist, though I think we're gaining. And we saw even a slight shift in disposition in our last couple of conventions that we realized this really is an issue that we ought to be thinking redemptively. Uh, we ought to be acting graciously. We, we don't want to violate the law, but at the same time, we want to treat these uh, persons who may be in our country uh, as we would want to be treated as the alien uh, that the scripture talks about needing to be loved on and cared for by the redemptive believing community. So I think that Russell is going to be able to um, speak very prophetically. I think it's going to become clear that we don't need to align ourselves with either party. Uh, what we want to do is align ourselves with biblical truth. And when the Democrats are doing something that lines up, we can applaud what they're doing. When the Republicans do something that doesn't line up, we can be a prophetic voice to them and, and chastise them in light of the scriptures. And so I think that's a much better posture for us to, to find and to pursue. And, and I think he's going to have the opportunity to do that. I think in a sense, it's been thrust upon him rather quickly in, in the last uh, six months. And so it's of necessity that he will speak from that posture. But I also know his heart. And one of our goals, I think, is praying for him and, and coming alongside of him that we really do allow the gospel. And I know it's easy to throw that around, but we really do allow the gospel to be the, the, the linchpin for how we then work out our ethic as we deal with all of these various issues. So, Russell, um, in light of that, uh, there's a few obvious things that we're about. Uh, you know, I think the pro-life one is, let's assume that one's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, the same-sex marriage, which we'll get to probably a little later in, mm-hmm. in, more, um, in our discussion. Uh, but what else? I mean, we mentioned immigration. Uh, uh, are, we, are we small government people? Is that part of the ERRLC's uh, stance? I mean, are we against the, you know, Affordable Health Care Act? I mean, what, what, what's... And I really would like to hear you tell us, kind of give us some guidance on the immigration issue from the perspective right now of the ERLC and how you are trying to help guide Southern Baptists to think biblically and, and graciously and truthfully in all of this. Well, with the, with the immigration issue, uh, there are really several pieces to that. One of those is calling us to recognize that the immigrant peoples around us are human beings created in the image of God, which most Southern Baptists... Uh, which is one of the reasons why Southern Baptist churches and leaders have been so good and proactive on this. And one of the things that happened to me that I found astounding, I was really taken aback at one point because I was doing a, uh, a television program with a, with a Spanish language, Hispanic uh, television program. And the interviewer, who was not a believer, she said, one of the things I hear consistently from Spanish speaking populations around the country is that nobody is more welcoming loving and receiving of them than Southern Baptist churches. Why, are, why do Southern Baptists love us and treat us so well? I'm not accustomed to being asked that question no. by the press. <laughs> uh, and so I just kept, I kind of sat back and said, could you repeat that again? I, I don't know. <laughs> Toward the camera, please. Uh, yes, right. That's exactly right. So, I, and I think the reason for that is because so one of the fastest growing demographic populations among Southern Baptists are uh, immigrant populations of various kinds. And so this isn't an abstract issue. You have people in local congregations who are trying to figure out how do we deal with this? It's not just a talking point issue. There's a pastor, very warm-hearted evangelistic pastor, who says, I've got people in my, in my congregation. I have a guy who was hurt and I wanted to take him to the hospital and he wouldn't go to the hospital because he has somebody in his family he's afraid they're going to deport. Uh, Now, the problem is the government has come in and has said, as my predecessor, Richard Land, put so well, it has two signs at the border, uh, help wanted and keep out. It's it's a mixed message that the United States economy is dependent upon immigrant labor. And then we have a system that just doesn't work where 11 to 12 million people are invisible, uh, which is dangerous for them. Uh, It's also dangerous in terms of rule of law. Uh, and so we've, we've got to fix it. And I think most Americans, we really, we have a lot of divisions on a lot of issues. This isn't one of them. Most of us, we have disagreements around the edges. Most of us agree we need a secure border. We don't need just open borders. And most of us agree we're not going to deport 11 to 12 million people. It would take a police state-sized government to do that, and it would collapse the United States economy. So then what do we do? to try to have people, some of them have not done anything wrong. They were brought here by their parents. Uh, some of them have broken the law, but they want to make things right. Uh, there, there's no way to make it right right now. How do we do that? So I think that's where we are. I really think as a country we're going to get something done about this. But the, the primary issue is speaking to congregations and saying uh, churches in, in South Florida, South Texas, uh, Southern California, they understand this already. The yes. rest of the country is going to as well. And we need to understand that when we're speaking to the communities around us, you kids get off of my lawn in Spanish is not a Christian way uh, to, approach, no. uh, to approach the world. So I think, I think we're getting there. I think we're, we're moving in the right direction on that. When it comes to the issues in front of us, uh, we, we basically have four categories uh, of importance. One of those is religious liberty freedom of conscience, protecting uh, the freedom of of everybody uh, to be able to live according to the religious beliefs and according to conscience for the advance of the gospel. Second is human dignity, uh, making sure that the right to life uh, is is honored and and protected. That applies to abortion. It applies to end-of-life questions as well and a whole range of things, human cloning, those sorts of things. Family stability, because we believe that God has made it clear that human beings flourish in families uh, seeing to it that the family is protected uh, and, not, uh, and not either intentionally or unintentionally torn apart. Uh, and then finally, civil society. How, how do we live together in a way that's, that's just? So those are our, our four issues, and really everything that we talk about is going to fall into one of those uh, categories. There are some things that we're going to speak to uh, because we have a, a clear word on those things or because we're 
provoking a conversation based on a clear word. There are other things where we're going to say we agree to disagree on those things. And we, we don't have a, uh, I don't have a Christian position on a line item veto. I don't have a, a Christian position on uh, any number of things. So we're not going to pretend as though we do. We all do that anyway when it comes to personal ethics. Right. I mean, there, there are certain things that we say very clearly and definitively. Somebody comes in and says, I want to leave my wife for my secretary. No, you, you cannot do that. Uh, but somebody comes in and says, what do I do about schooling with my child? Well, there are biblical principles that apply to that, but we don't speak to that with that same level of authority. I'm going to discipline the guy uh, in the first case who runs off with his secretary. I'm not going to discipline somebody necessarily who's doing something with schooling that I wouldn't do. So we understand in personal ethics there's a whole, there's a whole spectrum there, and sometimes we don't get that right. And sometimes it's not easy to see what that is. But the same thing, I think, applies socially and politically. What's going on with the Hobby Lobby thing? You, I was reading what you wrote about that and the threat that it is to, um, to religious freedom. Talk about that. Well, I mean, that is a really important case the Supreme Court is looking at right now. And really, it has to do with how we define religious liberty. There are some people who think religious liberty is about freedom to worship. It's about what you think and your opinions and it's about what you do when you walk in through the front door of your church or synagogue or mosque. Um, but that's not what religious liberty is. It does include that, but it's also to be able to freely exercise and to carry out uh, your religion. And so the Hobby Lobby case, Conestoga Wood uh, case that goes along with it, which is a Mennonite uh, group of woodworkers who are saying we object to this contraceptive mandate uh, for our business. We, we ask for this not to be imposed upon us. Uh, that's going to the Supreme Court. I think we're going to win that. And I think it's going to be the most important religious liberty uh, decision in decades. It's really going to have a lot to do with how we live out our lives in this country from now on. And I think a lot of us, when we think about religious liberty violations, we tend to think immediately of soldiers walking into a worship service and shutting down a worship service. That's not where the threat is right now. It's, it's in people trying to live out their lives without putting their conscience in a lockbox uh, during the week. And that's why that's Just uh, for, for those who are not as well read as Andy, what's going on with Hobby Lobby? <laughs> <laughs> Hobby Lobby is a company that is... Uh, the, I'm asking it, for a friend. It's motivated. <laughs> Hobby Lobby is a company. It's owned by Christians. Uh, it has Christian uh, motivations and everything they do. They don't open on Sundays because they want their people to be able to have a day off. They close at a certain time because they want their families, they, they want their employees to be able to be with their families. There are certain things they won't carry because of their Christian convictions and their stores. And now the government with the Affordable Care Act is saying you have to pay for uh, contraceptive uh, uh, pills and technologies, including some that are at least arguably abortion causing. Mm -hmm. And Hobby Lobby is saying we, we don't want to pay for that. We don't, we're not gonna say we object to the people uh, who work for us having that, but we don't want to be the ones who are facilitating and paying for it. Um, and the government's not to backing down on that. A huge coalition of us have gone time and time again, and it, it kind of spans, spans the whole spectrum from Roman Catholics and Southern Baptists all the way over to Hare Krishnas. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we don't agree. Uh, this, this whole group of people, we had a, a meeting uh, right before the 4th of July press conference at the National Press Club, and it was, we probably couldn't have agreed on anything in that room except that the government shouldn't pave over consciences uh, when it comes to, to these issues. So I think that's where this is going to be really significant and important. And you're optimistic that the Supreme Court is I going am. Okay. I am, because uh, there was a, a bill passed called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act was passed in the 1990s that said the government has to show a compelling interest why it would violate someone's free exercise of religion. Uh, I don't think that's happening here, and so I really think the court is going to go the right way on this one. What do you think the ramifications are of the gay marriage thing on religious liberty? Because, you know, you hear, I may have even heard Tim Keller on a, peller, uh, Tim Keller on a panel say <laughs> that um, it was one of the only times I've really seen him depressed looking because mm -hmm. uh, he's normally kind of, you know, Right. cheery in his weird kind of way, but he, yeah. um, he, uh, he <laughs> said that, you know, he just feels like it's becoming such an issue that it's going to become something that they're going to begin to use a heavy hand. So that's already happening now. Uh, and that's, that's only going to, to continue. Now, what, what's not going to happen, what I think most people 
uh, think when they think religious liberty is somehow the government's going to come in and say, First Baptist Church of Durham has to have same-sex wedding ceremonies. That's, that's not going to happen anytime in the foreseeable uh, future. What's going to happen, though, is for individuals who are saying, for instance, there's a florist in Washington State yeah. who says, you know, I can't participate in a same-sex wedding ceremony or a photographer in New Mexico says, I really, in my business, I don't, I don't feel comfortable endorsing this and being part of this, who are now in serious trouble with the law. That's going to be a significant religious liberty issue as it relates to individual consciences. And then as it relates to those ministries outside of the local church. So, for instance, adoption agencies. Uh, Catholic adoption agencies can't even operate right now in the state of Massachusetts. They lose a license because they won't place uh, children in homes without a mother and a father. Uh, They're not saying we want that outlawed. They're saying we don't want to do this. They're not able to operate. Uh, And then hospitals and and, and various other sorts of ministries, educational institutions, uh, those sorts of questions are going to be very very real uh, and, and upon us really quick. And Could we've you got to see be in the future uh, Christian schools that receive Pell Grants and other government funding losing that? Well, of course, because th- th- I'm not saying that will happen, but I'm saying that definitely could happen yeah. uh, because with the culture moving in such a way that it wants to equate uh, the sexual revolution with the civil rights movement, I think that's an illegitimate equation, but that's the, that's the equation they're wanting to make. Uh, that, that means these things are going to be really on the table, which means we have to, number one, fight for religious liberty, but number two, we have to be ready. Uh, those schools that are dependent upon government funding or those agencies that are dependent upon government funding are going to have to find a way to say we're going to be faithful to the gospel regardless of whether or not the government gives us a penny. That's going to be the key. What about church discipline cases? I mean, that would get right involved if there were a member that wanted to challenge their church's view on this and uh, said that there's some way to unite homosexuality with uh, Christianity and then the church disciplines them. Could they make that a test case? I think right now we're okay on, on those issues because we do have a First Amendment Uh, with a long history in this country with free exercise of religion. This isn't Europe. This isn't Canada. Uh, And so I do think that there is a reservoir in America of understanding that sense of religious liberty. And I think when it comes to the membership of a local congregation, at least as far out as I can see in the short term, uh, that's going to be an issue. Uh, Now, what that's going to mean, though, is that congregations are going to have to become increasingly uh, strategic uh, and intentional about making sure that they are doing church discipline. Uh, And I think one of the main things that's going to change right away is when it comes to the kind of marrying parson in American culture, the guy who just marries whoever shows up at the door and who opens up the church for whoever just kind of likes the architecture. That day is over and good riddance. Uh, now I think we're going to have the opportunity to say we're, we're marrying people because we believe this is a theological act and we're going to hold these people accountable to the church. I think that's going to, that's going to happen immediately in American culture. Don't all of you guys think that that's going to affect church membership and that we, it actually will be to our good because we will be forced to take more seriously the issue of church membership and those that we actually allow to enter into covenant community with us? I mean, certainly with you at First Baptist and Summit, That's going to be an issue you guys have to deal with, I would think. Well, you know, we've always said, you hear people say that that persecution is good for the church, and it's hard to even put this in the category of persecution in light of what brothers and sisters around the world go through. But um, when you think about the purifying effect, I think that that is one. You know, what does it mean to be a member? What does it mean to walk under the authority of Christ in in all those areas? Mm -hmm. And for me, as I look at it, as we go through church membership process, our greatest priority is the individual salvation, Mm -hmm. Uh, that we, that they understand the gospel, that they genuinely have repented and believed in Christ. And, and that's more important than whether they're actually a member of this local church. And so we use that as an opportunity to be certain that people are born again. And that would include people that come to us with these issues on Mm -hmm. homosexuality. We want to show them scripture and say, you know, you need to be very concerned about your soul and be concerned Mm -hmm. about your, that you're actually born again. Well, maybe shifting there just a little bit, I think a lot of pastors uh, find themselves, whether it's to a a newspaper reporter or to somebody in their congregation, when they're asking the question of why gay marriage should be outlawed, not the question of why homosexuality, why Christians believe it's wrong, um, assuming that we're on, you know, good footing with, with the scriptures, what are the best arguments that you hear in the Washington D.C. circles that 
marriage ought to be limited between a man and a woman. Well, the, the wrong way to think about it is the way that you just framed it with gay marriage being outlawed. I was doing that just for you, as an example. Of course example. you were. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Because, because no one is saying that gay marriage is, ought to be outlawed. We're saying, what is the definition of marriage and, wh- and why is that the government's business? I mean, one of the things that I did, I think two weeks after taking office, I went on a lesbian talk show in San Francisco uh, with this, uh, this talk show host who I think she described herself as a pansexual. Uh, oh, who, oh, oh, pan. pansexual, which means yeah, yeah. I want that defi- articulated for define. Uh, it for I think that means you know whatever. Whatever. Okay. Yeah. And, and I just uh, want to make sure what the pan word meant there. I was just yeah, wasn't okay. sure what to do with that. Don't, don't think about that don't, too. No, long. I'm not going there. Right. <laughs> yeah. So you, you, she said, "I want to have a I want to have a conversation about this." She said, "I'm not going to take calls because it would be really bad for you." I said, "Okay." So we're just going to have this civil conversation. We did for an hour. And one of the things that, that she wanted to do was to say, why do you want to keep this uh, from us? What I'm trying to say is we all agree there is some limit on what marriage is. I mean, all of us agree on that. You, you, we have friends. We don't go to the courthouse to license our friendships. Uh, when, a, when a friendship breaks up, we don't go to the court, courthouse and say we're, we're not speaking to each other right now and we need to separate it. We all agree there's some limit to what a marriage is. So why is the government interested in this particular union between a man and a woman? Uh, And the reason historically in every human civilization is because the government has to deal with the aftermath of what can at least potentially happen in the union between a man and a woman, which is children. The government has an interest in having families with both mother and father there because the government has to sort all that out. Even Solomon had to do that. Who do these children belong to here? And so that's the reason why this particular union is unique. And so it's not that we are saying there are gay marriages out there, we don't like them, we want them to be outlawed. We're saying there's a reason why the government has said, let's identify this as marriage. It's because the government doesn't invent this. Mm -hmm. Government doesn't come up with this. The government recognizes something that already exists and tries to remove all the impediments away from it and to support it. And so the, the problem is that as marriage definition gets just pulled outward and outward and outward, it starts to lose meaning at all. Why two people? Why not three people? Why not four people? Why not five people? What, why is it? And so as this becomes more and more elastic, it loses meaning, which is why in societies that, that start changing the definition of marriage, what you see is marriage is going down. I mean, we see this already in Western Europe, and that's bad for any society. What we want to make clear to our gay and lesbian neighbors out there, uh, remembering our gay and lesbian neighbors are not our enemy. Uh, these, these, are not our, these are not our enemies. These are the people in our communities that are neighbors that we need to love, we need to receive, uh, we, need to, we need to spend time with. To say what we're not trying to do is to take something away from you. We're saying what it is that you think you're looking for doesn't exist. Uh, and we believe that, that the government shouldn't come in and try to, try to create it ex nihilo out of nothing as though it does. Um, can, I, can I ask just in terms of, I, I mentioned when, when I first uh, said why I'm so grateful that you're there and that you teach us how to speak about these things, how to have the discussion. And so as the legislative questions come up and they say, why, what are the reasons you give? More and more, it seems to me that the only thing we can, we can stand on is thus says the Lord. This mm-hmm. is what the scripture says, that if you make other categories of arguments like um, you know, legal history or sociological studies and all that, are there, are there columns that you're working with other than thus says the Lord? Or do we say, look, this is what we've got to stick with. It's the only thing that isn't going to shift out from under our feet. Well, I think there, there are two wrong ways to do this. Uh, one of them is to say, uh, the Bible says this, and that's why you need to do it. Uh, you know, I, I was talking to a member of Congress one day, and he said, help me with this same-sex marriage thing. He said, because I'm trying to answer it. I'm opposed to it. But when they say, why? you know, why, I just say, that, that's, that just ain't the way we do it back at First yeah. Baptist Church. That's not a compelling argument in the no. public square. Uh, and, and, and because there are, all, there are all sorts of things that the, that the Bible says are wrong uh, that we're not, trying to, we're not trying to codify into, into law. Uh, that, that's the wrong way to go about it. The, the other wrong way to go about it, I think, is people who are motivated by their religious and theological convictions, but who are embarrassed by those things. And so they pretend as though 
they're not motivated by those things at all. I think it's also a wrong way. I think to come in and say, look, the reason why I think this is important is because I think marriage isn't just about marriage. It's a reflection of the Christ Church Union, Ephesians chapter 5. When we get this wrong, bad things happen to a society, to a family. Uh, and the reason that bad things happen is because it's, it's meant to be a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But there are all kinds of people in my community who don't agree with me about Ephesians 5. They don't agree with me about Genesis 2. That's okay. You also have a reason for this to be uh, in your interest, even before we get to that conversation, why you think this is important. So for instance, there are some people who will say, it doesn't matter sex and gender, these are all just social constructs. Nobody really believes that. I mean, the President of the United States has emphasized fatherhood and I think really in some, some heroic ways. He stood up and said, hey, men, take accountability in your home, and we need fathers to step in and be involved in their, their kids' lives. He understands there's something unique about fathering. That's right. It's not just parenting. It's fathering. There's something about a father that's different from a mother and something about a mother that's different from a father, and we need that uh, in a society. So most people get that and know that already. I think you use both the reasons why you're concerned about it uh, theologically in terms of the gospel, but also why even people who don't, who don't receive that really do have an interest in this in terms of human flourishing. When you just think in terms though of what is compelling to somebody, you know, as I'm sitting here listening to this through the ears or attempting to, for somebody to then respond and say, well, okay, yes, you know, that is a, a nuclear family is a, is, is but um, we want to incentivize two gay men living together in monogamy you know, for the rest of their lives and adopting children. What is there that is compelling that you say other than, well, a father and a mother is better? Yeah. Well, I mean, a father and a mother is better. And there's a, there's a reason why, and, and as an adoptive father, uh, someone who has adopted children, this is, this is an issue that is very important to me because a family that is formed by adoption is not some different kind of family. Uh, it is built off of the natural family. There's a father, there is a mother stepping into a place where those two roles have now, been, have now been evacuated. And even with a single parent, when you have a single mother who is raising up a child, there's a vacancy here where the father is. There is a father who ought to be there and who is gone. And that's explained and that's, that's seen. There's something that's wrong with that. It's not ideal. Uh, that we would say. I think that's important. And most people, most people see that and understand it. I think the reason why we're confused when it comes to this issue as a culture is because we've all been confused about this for a long time, including the Church of Jesus Christ. Uh, because we've, we've started seeing marriage as simply being about the two people involved. And, it's, uh, and that goes back to even the way we do weddings. They're a celebration of the love of Todd and Tina. It's all about Todd and Tina and their ratification of their love for one another. So that gay couple or lesbian couple in your community says, well, we, we've got love, so, so why don't we ratify that? Historically, though, and certainly within the church, that is not what marriage is preeminently about. It's about the entire community coming in and saying, this marriage, J.D. and Veronica's marriage, is our business. We all have an interest in this. We're witnesses to this. We're going to hold them accountable to this because this is a connection from previous generations and a connection potentially mm -hmm. to future generations. Mm -hmm. It's not just about celebrating and validating life. Yeah, I have a story about that that I use in premarital counseling a lot. A, a guy named Reb Bradley who has a, um, a family ministry, and, uh, but before he was in the ministry, he was a professional photographer. Mm -hmm. um, he was in a community doing a, a family life conference, and uh, someone saw his photograph and contacted him and said, hey, is there any chance you might have uh, photographed our wedding? I saw your picture there and uh, said, well, they talked about it a little bit. Yeah, actually, I was there. Uh, and then he, Reb Bradley, said, well, how's it going? He said, well, it's not going very well. So what do you mean? And he said, well, I think we're going to get a divorce. Hmm. There was this long pause, and then Reb Bradley said to him, you can't. The guy said, I beg your pardon? He said, well, I was there as a photographer, but I was there as a witness, and I heard what you said, and you mm. promised this is the very thing you wouldn't do, and I'm telling you, you can't. Well, the guy said, what do you want us to do? He said, work it out. And, uh, <laughs> and they got together and they worked it out and they didn't get a divorce. He actually wow. counseled them through Wow. It. We need more photographers. Right. <laughs> so you got a traveling ministry. <laughs> yeah. So, Russell, let me press this one more time from a slightly different angle because I think this is, it really is where we are living and where we will 
in the days to come. So it seems that what you're saying is that we are not so much outlawing or making an argument to outlaw gay marriage as you are incentivizing the, or by recognizing the, you know, the man, the one, one, one man, one woman marriage. And it seems that the reasons that you're giving are, I have my reasons as a Christian, but they're also good for you because they're pragmatic reasons. So essentially what I'm offering to them is my testimony that comes from faith in Christ and it's pragmatically beneficial for you, which mm-hmm. I just wonder how, honestly, how compelling that is which to somebody when you, cause it just seems like then you start getting in statistical number games and it just seems like that's well, it, hard it, to win. It's, it's not compelling to an, an individual or uh, to a couple in the moment. Almost nothing that we say is compelling. Uh, to people. I mean, uh, uh, people do what they want to do and they find reasons to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the case in, in, in almost every situation, virtually every situation that people are in. But you're not just talking to those people. Uh, you're talking to the people who are overhearing and listening to this to say, why does marriage matter to you? In the same way, you might have someone who says, I'm single. I'm not, I'm 75 years old. I'm not married. I'm never going to be married. Why in the world should I care about uh, marriage? What are you going to say? Well, marriage is important to you too as a single 75 year old lady. And here's why it's important to you. Uh, That might not be compelling to her at the moment, but you're not just speaking to her. You're, you're being overheard as to why we ought to care about this at all. And, and frankly, uh, what's really happening in the conversation, it's not a question and uh, most people who are involved on the other side of this argument acknowledge this very openly. This is not a question of taking marriage as it is right now and just expanding it out to include a new group of people. It's about changing what marriage itself is in order to fit a new paradigm uh, that's going to have implications for children, for society, for the culture, for religious liberty, for a whole host of other things. There's a third line of reasoning that I've heard made, and Andy alluded to it a minute ago, and it's the posture that says, um, you know, all laws have a basis somewhere, and for the United States history, our basis has been a constitution under God, you know, inalienable rights given by a creator, mm-hmm. and we are saying whether we are Christians or not, we recognize that these laws spring from this and on this issue, thus says the Lord. Mm-hmm. So therefore we've got to, you know, argue that this is something that for all the reasons, not just those, and you're, you're, you're going back to, you know, uh, you're still appealing to a, a thus says the Lord, even though you're not doing it the same way that you might do it with a Christian. Do you not find that as a part of the presentation? What I, what I would say is there's a reason why every major religion and every human civilization has privileged that male-female union as being something that is of, of public interest. Why is that? Uh, I think the reason that that is is not just because everybody came up with the same idea. Mm-hmm. It's because God has embedded this uh, in the created order. I mean, uh, Genesis chapter 2 uh, a man shall leave father and mother and cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. That is a powerful, powerful reality and drive that everybody has to recognize and to say, how do we deal with this as a village, as a tribe, as a community, as a nation? I think that's because it's so powerful because God has embedded the gospel in that. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I say that, and I say that openly. That's because God has created this. This is why this is resilient. I believe that, but you as a, a Muslim may disagree with me about uh, what Jesus says when he says what God has joined together and and in the beginning God created the male and female. But even you recognize and know that there are some differences between men and women and that this union is important and significant. I think we have to have both of those conversations at the same time. Uh, Simply coming in and quoting the Bible uh, and saying, uh, you know, the, the, the the Bible says clearly that homosexuality is sinful well, yeah, uh, but a believer marrying an unbeliever is sinful as well, but we don't think that ought to be, uh, that ought to be not recognized by the state. It ought to be recognized by the state. There's a difference between those two things. We have to make that clear. So you're making a kind of a we hold these truths to be self-evident. Exactly, type of exactly. We, we all are recognizing that we're at a point right now where that argument seems incredible. What people want is a killer argument. To be, to be able to say, what's the argument that I can make where everybody's going to say, oh, well, of 
course. You know, what were we thinking? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's not going to happen. There is, no, there is no such argument as that. What we're doing when we make this argument in the public square is to say this actually is a reasonable uh, position. We have reasons why we hold this. So it's very similar to what the Apostle Paul is doing before Agrippa when he's standing up and saying, you think I'm crazy, you think I'm out of my mind, I'm, I'm speaking to you rational words, this hasn't happened in a corner. Uh, he doesn't persuade Agrippa at the end, but he's, he's demonstrating the reasonableness of his position. I think that's the posture that we need to take as we speak to this issue. Isn't it the speech. case, though, that when the Supreme Court ruled on this, that uh, Justice Kennedy basically said, we don't have a reasonable argument? Oh, that's right. I mean, and, and that was what was so shocking about uh, those decisions that were handed down this summer is that Justice Kennedy said the position that has been held by virtually every human civilization that was held by President Obama until two and a half years ago uh, can only be motivated by hostility and animus toward gay and lesbian people, uh, which is setting the groundwork for a future court to come in and say, uh, this is a constitutional right. I mean, we need to recognize that those are the, the days that we're living in uh, right now. So if we go in this direction, I'm just curious for just a moment, I take it after this. Um, where, where does this end? What's the end game? If it tracks in this direction, where do you see things going? I mean, is it going to result in polygamy? Is it going to result in these uh, mixed kind of uh, relationships that are recognized? I mean, where, where does it go? Short term, maybe so. I don't know. Long term, I'm really optimistic about this, and for this reason, marriage is resilient. Okay. I mean, you, 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 think of, uh, you think of Jurassic Park, life finds a way, love finds a way. Uh, that is true. That's that killer argument That's right the there. killer there argument. Is. That's right. There it is. Jurassic Park, not three, just one and just two. one and two. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I think eventually what's going to happen is you have a lot of people who are ge they're genuinely hurting. Uh, and they think, if only my relationship were to be recognized the way somebody else's, these other relationships are recognized, then I'm going to finally get what it is that I'm looking for. I don't think that this will do it. Right. Uh, because I think that there is something about that one flesh union that is distinct and that is different. And so I think we're going to wind up in, in a few years with a lot of really disappointed people and we're going to have love in the ruins of all of this where we have to come in and try to speak to this. I mean, I think ha wringing our hands, I mean, there were a lot of people in the 60s when they're looking at Woodstock, they're looking at the, the age of Aquarius, they're looking at communes and all these things, and they're saying, you know, look at this demographically. We're going to wind up uh, in 2013 with a bunch of hippie communes with people just rolling around in the mud with each other uh, all the time. Well, it didn't happen. Well, why not? Because eventually people said this isn't working. Uh, we, we've got to find a different way. We have to be the sort of people who conserve and who preserve something ancient uh, to be able to say there is, a di there is a more excellent way. There is another way to live. I, I'm not pessimistic about it long term. Okay. Um. I know we'd love to press in more uh, on that, but get a couple other things before we um, end our first session here that I, I think would be worthy of getting to. And if you guys have anything to add, please um, jump in. Um, Southern Baptist is the largest Protestant denomination in the United States. Um, when you look at the Democratic National Committee this year opened up, or a uh, year or so ago when Obama was reelected, opened up the, the the, the national campaign with a statement about both abortion that was a radical departure from the safe, legal, and rare, and then also an affirmation of gay marriage. On the Republican side, you have a Mormon and a Roman Catholic that are representing the ticket. The last two Southern Baptists we've had significant in politics were Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton. Right. Um, Al Gore. You know, yeah. Oh, Al Gore. I forgot it. Mm -hmm. um, are, are, we, are we not? Are, are, is there something that is not taking place in Southern Baptist churches that is producing the kind of leaders and thinkers who can, because when you think of a Mormon and a Roman Catholic representing what many people would look at as a more conservative Christian side, whether that's accurate or not, they, they have that. Is there something, because I wonder, you know, I, I watch a lot of our contemporaries that there's kind of this, there was this moral majority movement, you know, mm -hmm. with Jerry Falwell, and then there's a reaction to that. Right. Um, there's the Rob Bell reaction, which is kind of the, you know, just it's a democratic version right. that pretends to be apolitical. And mm -hmm. then there's 
people are like, we're not interested in that. Mm-hmm. Is, there, is there ways that you could counsel us? I mean, is that something we should be equipping our people? Say some of you ought to be going into these fields and you ought to be on the vice presidential ticket one day. Well, what I don't think we ought to get into is a kind of identity politics that says, you know, we need our, our guys on the, the, the first or second slot when it comes to the national ticket. That always ends up badly. I mean, that, that was one of the things that happened in 1976. Mm-hmm. Um, I, was, I was four. Uh, but I remember the euphoria uh, that happened in South Mississippi among all the Baptists. I know finally one of us is on a ticket. I remember the article you wrote finally, about it. Yeah, that's right. It was, it well, was let, great. Let, let, let me be on Finally record. somebody without an accent <laughs> is on a national ticket. You know, I, that sort of a thing. I, I want to be on record. I am a Georgian. I voted for Gerald Ford. Did you? I did. Yeah. I'd seen him as a governor. Wasn't good. Well, I mean... The, the, <laughs> Was it good? <laughs> so I think, I think we can wind up being in a situation where that's easily manipulated by P. I mean, if, if what we were doing is emphasizing, you know what, we really need a Southern Baptist on the presidential ticket, suddenly we would have so many Southern Baptists who are just ready to come and to talk to us. They'd be pouring through Lifeway literature to be able to know all the right things to say uh, and to be able to, to sing the praise songs without having to look at the screen. So I don't think that's what we need to do. Uh, I think instead we do need to say that a calling into public life is a good and honorable thing, uh, and we need, to, we need to encourage that and empower that with people who are, who are raising upward. Do you think a lot of us are scared to do that because of the implication of it being moral majority part two? Maybe in part. I think for me, uh, because I have such a passion to see the gospel go to the nations because I've studied history because I looked at what the church did in the first century from a position of no power at all to turning the world upside down I think Romans 13 is true I want to be involved in the political process I want to do all that I can to promote that which is right and just and honorable and good but ultimately I worship a king I don't worship a president and therefore, it's always going to take a secondary status for me, not that I won't vote always and be engaged in these moral issues. I'm going to, but is it going to become my consuming passion that drives me like it, I think it has some in the past? No. What, what drives me is the gospel and getting the gospel to the ends of the earth. Mm-hmm. So that's going to be a different in priority. What are you, what's your thoughts, Andy? I agree. I think uh, we want to put the gospel central. We'll make it for, uh, first. We know that we're dealing with people's eternal souls. Romans 1.16 I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. We want to pray for kings and those in authority so that we might live peaceful and godly upright lives and because God desires all men to be saved. And so it's a salvation is the top priority there. And so our desire is that government would stabilize society and, and protect us both from criminal elements and from an intrusive tyrannical government right. so that we can do the business of the gospel. What coaching could you give to pastors about how to win and how to engage political issues, which ones, how frequently? Well, I think one of the things we have to be on watch for right now is that in evangelicalism, we tend to ping back and forth between extremes. That happens on the personal level. Mm -hmm. uh, That happens on the congregational level. People say, I don't want to go through what happened back then. So people who had really, really contentious business meetings uh, in their local congregation, they said congregationalism was a mess. Let's just go to where we don't have any congregational involvement at all and vice versa. We had a lack of accountability, so let's have a committee to go through every, every purchase of paper clips that we have happening in this church. And that, that happens on the personal level. Uh, if you grew up in a really legalistic, harsh, strict church, then you want to, let's not talk about commands. Let's just talk about who we are in Christ. And if you grew up in a really chaotic sort of thing, let's, let's regulate everything and t- really have a lot of rule-heavy Christianity. And the same thing happens here. There's a sense in which a lot of people want to overreact to a very highly politicized Christianity with what they believe is an apolitical Christianity. Let's just preach the gospel and let's not deal with with any issues that are of social or political uh, import at all. The problem with that is several things. One of them is, Andy was mentioning a few minutes ago that there are certain expectations of the government. That's exactly right. God holds Caesar accountable for what Caesar does with the sword. Caesar doesn't wield it in vain. He wields it with the authority of God. 
Caesar can overstep that authority and become a Revelation 13 beast state, do wrong things with the sword and be held accountable for that. In a democratic republic, the people are ultimately accountable for that sword. So we're accountable as those who are voting and participating and involved. We have to form those consciences of people in order to do that. That doesn't mean that we come in as though we have a word from God on every single policy uh, issue any more than it does when we're shaping people's consciences to serve as bank tellers and as policemen. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that we're coming in with a detailed position on how to manage a hedge fund. Uh, We form a conscience on what it is to deal justly that applies itself to hedge fund management, but but we don't come in with, with specifics on those sorts of things. I think we need, to, we need to speak in a way that doesn't allow ourselves to further cynicism. So if what we're doing is using the gospel in order to carry out a political agenda, people are going to see that and they're going to reject not only our political agenda but also the gospel behind it. Mm-hmm. We're speaking of the gospel, that's first and foremost, we're speaking to the implications of the gospel, but it's very clear Uh, which kingdom is preeminent in the way that we're speaking. Uh, I don't think that pastors ought to typically endorse candidates. I'm not saying that there wouldn't ever be a time when that wouldn't be an appropriate thing. John Leland endorsed Thomas Jefferson because it was religious liberty or no religious liberty. He did that. I don't think typically that's that's a good thing for congregations or for pastors to do for all sorts of, of good reasons. But that doesn't mean that you pretend as though you can be apolitical altogether. Mm -hmm. The churches and people who have thought of themselves as apolitical have tended to be the most political. Mm -hmm. So we mentioned, for instance, a little bit uh, ago about slavery. There were pastors all over the South, Southern Baptists and Southern Presbyterian pastors, who said, I'm not going to talk about slavery because I'm going to talk about the gospel. Well, if you stand up and you talk about the law of God and what God is going to hold you accountable for, but you don't talk about human slavery, you are talking about human slavery because you're saying to that slave owner, when you stand before God in judgment, he's not going to be asking you about whether or not you claim to own another human being. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you don't speak to that, you are speaking speaking to that. If you're in 1925 Mississippi and you're preaching against drunkenness and fornication and adultery and you're not talking about lynching, when you have people who are lynching other human beings created in the image of God, you are speaking to lynching because you're saying this is not something that you're going to be held accountable for. And in 2013 America, if you stand up and you speak to uh, sexual morality and poverty and those sorts of things, but you don't speak to abortion, Mm -hmm. when you have human beings who have their very personhood being denied, you are speaking to abortion by saying this isn't something that really is worthy of being held accountable for. Russell, is limited government one of those things? Yeah, I've heard people say, would it be better for the church, would it be better for society to live in a pro-life USSR or a pro-choice democracy? So if you you had one or the other, you know, and and the argument being that it probably wouldn't be better to be in the pro-life USSR. So... So is limited government and the ramifications of it, is that something that there has to be a proactive stance on or is that the one that is in that area of the hedge fund? Well, no, I mean, to to some degree, yes, of course, because the Bible says there is a limit on uh, the government. The government that says you cannot worship God is a government that's too big. Uh, 666 beast state in Revelation 13 is a government that is too big. Most of us, though, agree on that. Uh, The arguments that we tend to have in American society doesn't tend to, these don't tend to be between people who want a totalitarian, all-encompassing uh, state and people who want a uh, state of nature, uh, you know, no stop signs. Most of us are in this little, this little place here in the middle where we're saying, how big ought the government to be? What should the social safety net be? And in that sense, there are a lot of uh, decisions being made there that aren't Uh, easily uh, determined by appealing to biblical authority, their prudential judgment uh, questions. So last question, then we'll wrap up this one. Racial equality and where that is in the United States, what role do you think the church ought to be played in this to be where we should be and then even out in front of it? What happened in the civil rights movement is exactly the reverse of what should have happened. The, the, The result was right, but the way it happened was that we had people speaking to churches 
and saying, you are hypocrites who do not hold to the gospel you say you hold to. What should have been happening is that congregations should have been the ones leading the charge in the South, congregations, should have been leading the charge to the outside society saying, repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. And if you want to see what the kingdom of God looks like, look within our congregations mm. where you have people who are united around the blood of Christ and around the spirit of Christ, at where there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither white nor black, but all are sons of God in Christ. That's what should have been happening. Right. Instead, you had a church that adapted itself to the outside culture uh, it, it took on those political realities of the culture around it and then tried to find proof texts in the Bible to try to salve their guilty consciences. Mm -hmm. And they had to have their consciences being arrested uh, and, and spoken to by a prophetic word coming from the outside of those congregations. They should have been leading. We need to be the people who, when it comes to those issues of tearing down the carnality and the evil and the Satanism of racial division, uh, we need to be leading within congregations, which means we need congregations that aren't built around the same value systems as the outside world. Uh, that doesn't just apply to ethnicity. Uh, that, that also applies to all sorts of other things. I mean, it's, it's amazing how in a lot of congregations, the people who have the standing and the power in the outside world also have the standing and power in that local congregation. Mm which is not what the scripture tells us ought to be the case. James says, don't put the poor in the back of the congregation, not because he's saying, be nice to the poor, feel sorry for them. He says, don't feel sorry for them. They're the future kings and queens of the That's universe. Right. Don't you know God has chosen the poor to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? So the, the inside of the church ought to be turning all of those things on their, on their head. And so I think where we ought to be in 20 years is that the very conversation of white churches and black churches and blue collar churches and white collar churches ought to be completely meaningless. And instead we ought to have congregations that don't seem to have anything necessarily else in common except for the gospel and the blood of Christ. When you start to see that, I mean, that's what was so striking about the, the first century churches. You have Jews and Gentiles in the same body which is a sign to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Uh, and I think that has to happen uh, intentionally. I think when we're going to see real progress on this issue is when we stop assuming that we have white people who are ministering to black people right. and Latino people and, and other, other folks. Uh, that still assumes some kind of normality for white people and we're blessing everybody else. That's, most of the kingdom of God is not white America. Uh, and, and so we need to step back and recognize when, we, when we're going to see progress, I think, is when we see majority white congregations in the Southern Baptist Convention calling African-American pastors. Right. Okay. And That's not right. because they're saying, well, our community is changing, so we want to reach African-American people, so this is a strategic move, but because this is our pastor. We're yes. following. When we start to see that, I think we're going, to start, we're going to start to see God doing some really, really good things. If you, and this is for, um, if you were to rule out the extreme cases of clear racism, mm -hmm. you know, we're just, um, what would you say to this group and to us about is racism still a problem in the United States? Because, you know, there's some pundits that are going to say it's, that's all made up, you know, that's, those issues have been settled and we just need to quit revisiting it with every new movie that comes out. And there are others that say, no, this is a big problem. You just don't see it because you're part of the privileged class. I mean, how would you coach? Racism us? still is a problem in, in the United States of America. It, it isn't, it isn't a, a lawless, anarchic regime as it was in 1965 Mississippi, where you essentially had a police state. Uh, but you still have uh, racism and, and bigotry present in American society. I had a, an African-American pastor friend who I still, I think of this almost every day because he called me and he said, pray for me. He said, I'm doing college applications for my son. He said, and there are a couple places that my son wants to go to school and I'm praying he doesn't get accepted. Mm -hmm. He said, it's a good school. 
He said, but it's not a good place for black people there. And I'm really worried about his safety if he were to go there uh, and about his prospects if he were to go there. And I stepped back and thought, you know, I've got five sons and I, I will never have right. to have that sort of prayer going on in my mind. I think there are a lot of things that, that white people, including white Christians, just don't even see because we're not in those places and we're not in those congregations uh, or they're not in those conversations. And so it's easy for us to say, well, racism is over because uh, we don't have signs that say these are the water fountains that belong to white people or to black people. But there still is a persistent strain of racism because we still live in a fallen universe where people want to prize and to idolize the flesh. And one of the persistent ways they want to do that is to say, my racial identity is superior to yours. That is going to be present. And sometimes it can be even more pernicious when it goes underground, where people don't want to say it, but they find all kinds of other ways to express it. Uh, I think that's when it becomes really dangerous.